Amen. Three years ago, we looked at these passages and the title of the message on that day was a troubling word. Today, we will find a faithful word. Bow your heads with me. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we might embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. From the Augsburg Confession, Article 5, concerning the office of preaching. To obtain such faith, God instituted the office of preaching, giving the gospel and the sacraments. Through these, as through means, he gives the Holy Spirit who produces faith where and when he wills in those who hear the gospel. It teaches that we have a gracious God, not through our merit, but through Christ's merit when we so believe. We began our worship this morning with the words from Psalm 89. Now I remind you of the opening verse. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Now, the Christian year begins with a season of preparation, a season of waiting. The word Advent comes from a Latin word, Adventus, which means coming. And it's a term often taken to designate either the incarnation of Christ or the parousia, his second coming. In the church, it designates the season immediately preceding Christmas. In the Western church, it comprises the four Sundays prior to Christmas, whereas in the Eastern churches, it begins in mid-November. And today is the fourth Sunday in Advent, the last Sunday. All of our Advent candles are lit. This Sunday is the one that's closest to Christmas, and our thoughts today look more to Christmas then to the second coming. Our gospel text tells us how the angel Gabriel told Mary about God's choice that she be the mother of God. Verses 26 through 33, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Nazareth or city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. The New Testament authors, Matthew and Luke, were clear. Mary was a virgin. She had never known a man. The Old Testament passage that the church saw prophesying this uses a word in Hebrew, Alma, that can mean either virgin or young woman. And normally the customs connected to marriage in Israel would have made it rare for a woman to reach even middle age without having become a married woman for reasons connected to the tradition that Mary remained a virgin even after Jesus' birth, Joseph was understood to be an older man who had children from a previous marriage. These details make for an interesting story, but they are not the points that connect us to God's promise. 
what makes this child special beyond the impossibility of a woman giving birth to a male child without the presence of a man's DNA is his connection to the promise of God. The promise of God made to David, the man after God's own heart. Psalm 89 verses three and four, you have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. According to Matthew 1, 17, 28 generations passed between David's reign and Christ's birth. 28 generations waiting for the son of David. 28 generations to a point where many people might have even given up on the idea or reinterpreted God's word to be poetic references to the nation of Israel. It isn't that the church plagiarized Israel's story. The truth is, Israel's story was never really about Israel. It was always about Christ. And furthermore, Christ's story isn't just about Jesus. The plan of God is about the redemption of this fallen creation, the restoration of mankind's role as God's image bearer to its sanctified original status. Many have given up on their purpose and have settled for a purpose that's so limited, so small by comparison. Success in the world is defined by the number of our possessions, the extent of our influence, or the dollar value of our portfolio. And to achieve this limited version of success, they're prepared to break every one of God's commandments, to resist the Holy Spirit screaming into the wind about their autonomy, and to destroy both themselves and one another. So loud, so strident, and so destructive are they that they appear to be thwarting God's mission to redeem his creation. But instead, they would drag it down to destruction with them spitting into eternity, Satan's line from John Milton's Paradise Lost, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Others ignore the revelation that God desires all men to be saved in 1 Timothy 2 and 4 and shrink back from Christ's will that we be his witnesses per Acts 1 and 8. They sit passively in the sanctuary, bemoan the loss of our so-called Christian culture, but fear to say one word to someone regarding the goodness of Jesus unless the stranger before them gives them a sign that he or she already knows about it. Others sit, watch what others aren't doing, make a list checking it twice so they can tell everyone else that they're not, everyone else is naughty, but they're nice. And this is far worse. Because when we do these things, contrary to those who admittedly are outside of the kingdom, we allow fear to rule us or prejudice to determine our activities when they should be determined by the word of Christ. I have to say here we, because I have also been guilty of this sin. And that's what it is. The Bible is clear, Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And Colossians 4, 5, and 6, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Yeah, I know some people would say, isn't that just being so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good? But isn't the earth still the Lord's and all his fullness? Isn't God's word forever settled in the heavens? Then if that's the case, then he still rules. He still reigns. 
His wisdom is still greater than our wisdom and the wisdom of God. In fact, let me call it like it is in the eyes of the world. The foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. You know, when we allow those open doors to close, when we let the opportunity pass by to speak the gospel to those whom we meet, we're denying to others the opportunity to experience the power of God that brings salvation. When we go through our days acting as if it is that God only reigns on Sunday between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m., we have not truly submitted to the Lordship of Christ, but are instead yielding to Satan. And I confess, I have committed this sin. I admit I've looked the other way when I could have gone to a wounded sinner and bound up his wounds with the oil of gladness, the good news of Jesus Christ. In fact, just yesterday, I, I, I went to do what I thought to be a good thing. I went to Harold's Chicken, bought a little meal just to support local business. And a man came up to me. He had on a black t-shirt said, I cannot breathe. And he asked me for some help to get a meal. I gave him the money, but that's really all I did. He took the money, said, thanks. I said, you're welcome. And then I rolled my window back up, pulled out the parking lot. At that moment, I felt pretty good. After all, I gave him Gave him money for a meal. Then I came back home and got back to studying our text for the day. And it hit me like a sledgehammer. You know how God's law is a hammer that breaks into pieces. And I realized, yes, I fed his body for a moment. And I left his soul empty. I gave him enough to get something to, to stave off hunger pangs for today, but left him starving for eternity. We cannot confess that we've done our duty when we've encouraged no one to turn from the darkness of this evil age and turn to his marvelous light. Can God yet obtain his desire for this city? Is there yet a balm in Gilead? Is there still good news, Gary? Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Back to God's word. And Mary said to the angel, how shall this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child that is to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age was also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. The odds seemed to be against her. She was a virgin. Interestingly, Mary didn't consider the possibility that this would take place after the season of her betrothal was fulfilled and she entered Joseph's house as his bride. Such would have been a natural solution to the seemingly impossible declaration by Gabriel. But in the face of Gabriel's declaration, she only saw what she was at that moment, a virgin. God declares to us in his word that you shall be holy for I am holy. And in that moment, when God's pure word is declared, we only see the impossibility of our own holiness, knowing the weakness of our flesh. In that moment of clarity, we don't look for earthly solutions to our dilemma, but God knows that our use as his vessel is based upon his power, not upon our weakness our spiritual immaturity, God knows that he must work in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure, but that is the only way in our weakened state, our sinful state, that his kingdom will come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God is not expecting us to do his work in our strength, but he offers more grace as it is written, 
James 4, verses 5 through 8? Or do you suppose that it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's not yet Christmas. The days have not yet drawn near for Christ to arrive. And there's still time to prepare. The day is coming, however, just as surely as once Mary felt the quickening in her womb, she knew that the day of delivery would come. So we too know that having heard the Holy Spirit speaking through this message, we know that Christ's return is nearer than when we first believed. Now is the time for us to prepare the way of the Lord. Now is the time for us to make his path straight for those who think that it is hard to discern and difficult to travel. Today is the day of salvation for Jesus will return. And as he is declared, his reward will be with him. Therefore, as Paul wrote in Romans 13, Beginning at verse 12, the night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to, to gratify its desires. So there is a good ending to today's lesson. Verse 38, and Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. When Mary confessed, I am the Lord's servant, let what you have said take place according as you have spoken. The angel knew that his work was done and the angel departed from her. Not in judgment as he did with Zechariah in the face of his unbelief, but in peace, knowing that Mary had heard the word of the Lord and responded in faith. I pray that I haven't baffled you with many words or battered you into condemnation without a hope of remedy. Because even now, I do believe that there is a balm in Gilead that there is hope for this city and that we have this hope in this house. It might be in jars of clay, for we have not, might not have been perfect examples of God's witness in Gary, but we are his witnesses. Say that with me. We are his witnesses. Now to him who's able to strengthen you, according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. He's coming soon, saints and his reward is with him. He's come today with forgiveness for you. He comes today to dwell in you richly through the blessed sacrament of Holy Communion. But know this, saints of God in Gary. Know this, St. John's Good Shepherd, all of those who are listening, know this, that he is here and he is coming, amen. He is coming in all power and he's given to us power, amen. He's coming in victory and he's made us more than conquerors, amen. He's coming in grace and he gives us more grace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord, amen.